Greiner Talks, Greiner Talks, about sustainability and transformation. A Greiner podcast episode. How to create a sustainable future, how to change. That's what we are discussing here. My name is Alexander. I'm part of the sustainability team at Greiner. My guest in this episode is a physicist, an author, and an expert on complex systems. As a professor, he's teaching at the Technical University of Dresden. And there, he's also leading the Center for Synergy of Systems. Welcome, Dirk Brockmann. Hi, how are you? Dirk, thanks for joining this conversation. How is your day? Are you in between lectures or working on complex research? At the moment, I'm in my home office in Berlin, and I'm traveling a lot between Berlin and Dresden because I'm transferring a lot of infrastructure from Berlin to the Technical University of Dresden, and I'm back and forth and at the moment in my home office. And what is going to happen at the Technical University of Dresden? I have seen that you're starting a big new project there. Yes, I'm building a new center called the Center Synergy of Systems, of which I'm the founding director. And in the center, we are trying to combine medical sciences, life sciences, and social sciences in one institute. And there are going to be data scientists, network scientists, and a bunch of scientists from all sorts of fields. And we just want to integrate this. What do you want to achieve by integrating these different disciplines and perspectives? Well, I think one of the reasons is I've never really understood why we need scientific disciplines and borders between them. So especially when we look at some phenomena that I'm interested in, for instance, pandemics or climate change or social contagion and phenomena that occur in all sorts of fields. And I would like to look at these complex systems and bring in people from all sorts of fields from the ground up, like young students that are going to be exposed to methods, ideas, and perspective from all of these traditional fields integrated in one center. I really love that approach of breaking down the barriers between different fields and disciplines. And you've also mentioned some complex phenomena. That is something we're talking about today. And I'd like to start by asking a kind of naive question. What is complexity? What is complexity science? Well, Complex systems are typically understood to be systems that cannot be connected to one traditional scientific field. For instance, the pandemic. The pandemic is a virological phenomenon, but it's also a behavior phenomenon. It's also a psychological phenomenon or an economic phenomenon. So it has aspects of every traditional field. And complex systems often have this property. But complexity is usually referring to the science of complexity. It's also a scientific field, but without borders. In fact, it connects traditional fields like social sciences and life sciences or economics and ecology. And the idea is instead of reducing a complex phenomenon into little pieces that are then investigated in each traditional discipline, We look at it from a holistic point of view. We try to extract the essence of a phenomenon and identify what is negligible. When you, for instance, look at collective behavior of animals and schooling fish or flocks of birds, you will find that all of them are governed by very basic fundamental dynamical laws. And when you have discovered this, you can apply it to collective behavior in humans, for instance, pedestrian dynamics or the contagion of information. So you see similarities. That's the idea of complexity science, identifying similarities of phenomena that occur in very disconnected fields. There's one sentence that many of us have heard at conferences or events or in lectures, and that is, our world is becoming increasingly complex. I'm wondering, is that true? Is it a fact or is that just an assumption? Well, what's certainly true is that it feels like it. And when it feels like it, the question whether it's actually happening becomes an academic question because then it relies on the definition of what it is. And what is complex? How do you measure complexity? And there are various ways of doing this. One way of doing it is observing connectivity 
and how it increases. So one aspect of complexity is network science or you know, looking at phenomena that are driven by underlying networks. For instance, if you look at an ecosystem, there are a bunch of species in it that interact with one another, forming a complex network. And now I think it's safe to assume that the complexity of networks in biological systems has not changed so much, certainly not within the last century or so. But if we look at human society, we have established during the past century a number of additional architectures and technologies that connect us in different ways. And I think, you know, when it comes to communication, cell phones, mobility, the internet, we have become parts of large scale networks in which every you know, node in the network is an individual and interacts with very many other individuals simultaneously. And I think this is what we mean by the complexity has increased, especially also because many of these networks are information networks. So we're exposed to a lot of information. You know, we know every conflict on the planet. We read it on the news. We read about it on social media. We know everything at an instant just looking at our cell phone. And so we're exposed to all this information. And I think this gives the sensation that we're living in an increasingly complex world. That was also my kind of assumption that maybe we just know much more than we knew 20, 30, 40 years ago and therefore assume that complexity has increased. I mean, there are some people that say that, but if you say something like this, if you say some quantity has increased, you need to first know how to measure that quantity. And that's quite difficult, and there are various ways of doing it. You know, there are ways of measuring information or information flow, but that's only one aspect of it. And it's also a very anthropocentric view, because when we say the world, we mean us. But we as humans are, you know, when we think about the biosphere, are negligible species. You know, we've existed for like 100,000 years, which is nothing. We're likely to go extinct. And so it's a very weird way of saying the world when we mean us, human society. You have mentioned species. And two years ago, you have released or published your book, Im Wald vor lauter Bäumen. It's quite difficult to translate, but it's something that there's a lot of trees in the forest. And it kind of deals with the complex behavior of animals versus humans. What is the message of the book? What similarities are there between humans and animals? Well, so I've been convinced working in like life sciences, biological systems as a physicist, and at the same time working on social systems and social science with methods from physics, I've never understood the fundamental separation of social sciences and natural sciences. I don't think it's helpful. And when you, you know, roll back in time into the Renaissance, there were a bunch of scientists that never really separated these things. And Alexander von Humboldt or a bunch of others, like even poets that did science or the separation of arts and sciences that used to be different. And to me, working very specifically in, in phenomena that occur in natural systems and phenomena that happen in social systems, I think it's quite beneficial to see the connections between the two for various reasons. A, because they often follow very similar building principles or dynamical rules or, you know, fundamental laws that, that govern behavior. And B, it also helps to bridge this artificial gap between a science that studies us, human beings, and their social behavior and nature. And I think it's beneficial to see us as a species that have certain properties and have a certain impact on their environment. And I'm not sure if we deserve to have a specific field just talking about us, I think it is helpful to bridge the gap between social sciences and, and natural sciences. Also because sometimes in school people, students, young kids in school, they are biased either towards like the social sciences or natural sciences. And quite early on, you know, I've, I've seen kids that say, 
you know, I can't do natural science because I can't do math. And then they they have like the stigma, which is nonsensical. It's just because it's not taught well enough in school, and uh, some people take longer to get it, and some not. And but it doesn't mean that they can't do it. And to me, it's just you know, mathematics, for instance, is a very powerful tool. So is computer science, both in the natural sciences and the social sciences. And I think this bridge between natural sciences, social sciences, that is something that fascinates me a lot about sustainability. Because in this area, it seems like everything is connected. I mean, for example, if you look at the CO2 emissions coming from a coal power plant in Europe, it probably has impacts on the livelihoods of children who are not even born yet. So it's a very interconnected and very complex system in my understanding. What can somebody working in a sustainability learn from this kind of complexity? Well, that's the first step, right? I mean, let's say we talk about climate change. And I mean... All of this, all of what we are communicating now has been known for like 50 years. So the question is not, have we been doing like the communication wrong? Because what is there to improve? But the question about climate change and sustainability is, is not a question about CO2 emissions. It's not a question about tipping points in the global earth system. That's been known. But we have to ask ourselves, why have we known this for so long? but nothing is happening. And so sustainability or climate change is the study of human behavior and behavioral changes. We can show these graphs like a thousand more times of like the CO2 emissions and the Atlantic tipping or the Amazon tipping or the ice caps melting. We can show it a thousand more times. If nothing is happening, then we have to ask ourselves why. And it's something about our collective behavior. So all of the effort should go into how do we change behavior. So the science of sustainability, the science of climate change, or getting on top of what is happening, is the science of behavior and perception. And that's where everything has to go. And talking about perception, talking about behavior... I work in the plastics and foam industry, and that's an industry with lots of implications for the environment, an industry that also faces a very strong public opinion. I have realized there's no black and white. The situation is very complicated, complex. How do you deal with that kind of struggle that our opinions are often based on headlines, on short facts, on figures, but usually the problem is much more complicated and multi-layered? Sometimes. And sometimes it isn't. And the thing about complexity is also that, yes, there are very intricate systems, you know, a lot of moving parts in a system. And so if you change a little bit here, it's going to have an effect somewhere else. That's certainly the case. But often you can handle that sort of complexity. What gets in the way usually is that because the way things are communicated, a lot of people run around with caricatures of reality in their head. So you may hear a pro and a con, or like an aspect of, let's say, about CO2 emissions. And you hear a number, and the number sounds very large. And then you say, oh, that's a very large number, that's horrible. But when we compare numbers, especially large numbers, you know, at some point everything becomes equal and we lose the connection to scale. And then people run around with like weird images of reality in their head and it doesn't incite the right feelings, the right emotions. So let me give you one example. The other day in the German news there was a headline that annually the government loses 58 million euros due to unemployment benefit fraud. So people that, you know, fraudulently get money for unemployment. That's a large number, 58 million. So that was a news headline. And obviously the response of many people is going to be, oh, that's horrible. You know, we have to cut unemployment benefit because people are misusing the system. Now, at the same time, the country loses a hundred billion euros every year due to tax fraud. That's 2,000 times as much. And, you know, these two numbers, 58 million and 100 billion, sound very large. 
But if you compare them, the loss of taxpayer money due to unemployment benefit fraud is negligible if you compare it to tax fraud. You know, it's like comparing the speed of a Concorde supersonic jet to the speed of a turtle. So we don't have a feeling for scale. And that is often used by politicians by, you know, giving anecdotal evidence. And then people have a caricatures of reality in their head. What do you as a scientist, as a researcher, learn from this kind of example? Well, we need to communicate scales better, for instance, and think about what people perceive. Because at the end of the day, climate change and sustainability and all of these things require a fundamental restructuring of society. And we don't want that because it's so radical and it's so new and it's going to be so different. But the only way I see people are willing to do something radically different is when they're either super scared or when there's a promise at the end, something really cool. So let's say you have never been to New Zealand, but people have told you it's so wonderful, it's so beautiful there, but you don't like traveling. It's annoying, you know, you're scared of long flights. But because there's going to be this wonderful country that you haven't seen, you might do this for you radical step and go on a plane, fly around the globe and look at this beautiful country. Or your doctor tells you if you don't change your diet, you're going to have a heart attack within two years. You might change your ways radically. And so when we communicate something about climate change and we say 1.5 degrees, We know as scientists that's horrible. 1.5 degrees or even more is going to be horrible. But it doesn't sound that way. If we think about 1.5 degrees, we think about, oh, I'm going outside at 24 degrees. It doesn't matter whether it's 24 or 25.5, which is true. But the number doesn't communicate the consequences. So we need to think about what it means. Like, can you translate that into something people feel? something they can relate to and that's often not done well and probably also communicating the potential positive outcomes if we do take action because i think that we often focus on negative consequences yes we need to draw a picture of the promised land because it's going to be so much better if we want to you know there's going to be clean air there's going to be cities without cars and there's going to be cities without noise there's going to be brilliant public transportation, there's going to be less starvation. Everything can be a lot better. And we just need to understand that we can make it. We can do it. It's going to cost billions of euros. But, you know, just imagine how much billions all the wars cost, all the conflicts, all this horrible, the horror that is occurring, you know, if that money were to be invested differently, if we didn't have to travel so much if we had a better notion of what kind of energy we we're using, it's just much better. You know, we can shape the future. That's one of the things that maybe we humans can do. We can make decisions that are against our intuition, against our gut feeling, but wise and, you know, anticipating the future. So yes, it can be great. Dirk, I always find it very exciting to see what kind of personal motivation brings people to a certain profession or discipline. What sparked your interest in physics, in complexity, in this kind of research? Well, mostly the magic in it. So that sounds kind of weird from a scientist, but <laughs> so when I think about physics and biology, both of these fields, there are elements in it that, that are so strange, that are so weird, so unbelievable in a sense, that it's the closest thing to magic one can get. And that's why I like it. You know, if you think about cosmology or relativity or quantum physics, that stuff is so strange. And you look at ecosystems and like where microorganisms live, the kind of weird cooperations and symbiosis that exists. And you look at it and you think that's unbelievable, you know, how that could have evolved. And so that's also a kind of magic. So to me, It's the magic in these sciences that draw me in. As someone who researches complexity quite a lot, 
how can I imagine your personal life? Do you try to live a very minimalist and simple lifestyle as an alternative to your research? Ah, that's an interesting question. So I try to, you know, running a team, everything is dominated by administration. And I don't like it actually very much. So I try to reserve time for two things, to like do science myself and actually dive deeply into a problem and also to explore different fields. I read a lot about things that are way outside my field and then I dive into it. And that's it's almost like an exploration into knowledge. So I, I'd like to remain an explorer. I think that's a very positive note to kind of end the conversation. But before I let you go, Dirk, I'd love to invite you to do a short word wrap with me, if that's fine for you. Sure. You will get one word, one term, and you can reply with whatever comes to your mind. That can be a word, sentence, or even a short story. Okay. First one, minimalism. Something I admire. Germany. My home, but um, I have a very difficult relationship with it. Astronomy. I love it. The climate crisis. Drives me crazy. Your favorite animal? Pig. Why? I just love them and they're smart and they're cute and I just like them. I have no idea why. <laughs> and last but not least, your message to the world? Stay optimistic. That's the best possible ending for this conversation. Thank you so much, Dirk, for joining me here. It was fun. You're welcome. I enjoyed it too. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Please have a look at Dirk's book, Im Wald vor lauter Bäumen. Lots of trees in the forest. Make sure to go on to the website, complexityexplorables.org. And have a great day. Griner Talks, a Griner podcast. Subscribe now.